Hello, my name is Rod Sinclair and I'm a specialist dermatologist. Well, may you ask, what is a specialist dermatologist? Well, I did my basic undergraduate medical training, worked as a doctor for a number of years, and then did additional specialist training in dermatology. And now I work as an expert in the diagnosis and treatment of patients who have problems or diseases with their skin, including skin cancer. In order to see a dermatologist, you need a referral from your general practitioner, and we work alongside with your general practitioner to make sure that our patients are provided with the best care available in diseases of the skin, and that care is delivered in conjunction with your general practitioner. Who is at risk of getting skin cancers? Well, the simple answer to this is Australians, and about 10% of the world's skin cancers occur amongst Australians, and Australians have the highest rate of skin cancer of any other country in the world. And amongst Australians, the people who are at most risk are the people who sunburn easily. These are people with fair skin, blue or green eyes, fair hair, who come from a, a Northern European ancestry. Even though the risk is slightly lower if you have an olive complexion or even a dark complexion, the risk is still not zero. So pretty much any Australian can get a skin cancer. There are also a couple of special groups who are at very high risk of getting skin cancer. And those are people who have a, a problem with their immune system and that might be caused by medications that they're taking. A, a classic example is people who have had an organ transplant and are on immune modulatory medications to prevent them rejecting their organ. That also can compromise the way in which the body's immune system fights against the cancers. And we also know that there are some people who just are more genetically susceptible to cancer and sometimes we can look at their skin and we can identify various markers on their skin that predict that. So with regards to melanoma, which is the, the, the most dangerous form of skin cancer, when we examine someone and we notice that they've got a lot of moles, particularly if they've got a lot of what we call dysplastic nevi, which are large, irregularly shaped moles, those are people who are at increased risk of melanoma, but also people who have had a melanoma affecting a first degree relative have a higher risk and so there's a range of factors that the dermatologist will take into consideration in determining what your individual risk is of developing a skin cancer. So if you've had a melanoma, we need to monitor that once it's been treated, that it doesn't recur in the scar where it was removed, that that melanoma doesn't spread to internal malignancies, and equally important is that you don't develop a second and unrelated melanoma on some other part of the skin, because we know that the sun wasn't just shining on that one spot. The very first thing you need to do is to determine whether you, in fact, you are a high-risk individual. And that might start with a conversation with your GP and just asking them, am I in a high-risk group for the development of the skin cancer? And your GP should be able to answer that question. And if you are a person who's at high risk, then you need to be familiar with your skin. You need to know what is on your skin, what's normal, and you need to be able to recognise when something new appears or when something starts to change. And at the end of the day, the sooner you diagnose the melanoma, the sooner you cut out the melanoma, the greater the cure rate and the longer you're gonna live. So melanomas, which are the, the pigmented dark spots, which are the most dangerous form of skin cancer, they tend to occur on areas in men, on the back, on the trunk, in women often below the knees, but they can actually occur pretty much on any part of the, the skin. Now there is a particular variant of melanoma which occurs on the face, which is called a, a melanoma in situ, or Hutchinson's melanotic freckle. There's also a type of melanoma that can occur on the palms and the soles, and you can even get melanomas on the fingernails, or sometimes even on the back of the eyeball. But the most common sites for melanoma, back in men, lower legs in women. Now squamous cell carcinoma, which is one of the types of the keratinocyte cancers, most commonly occurs on the scalp and the backs of the hands, which are the areas that have had the most sun exposure. And when I'm talking about the scalp, it's particularly the scalps of bald men. Women who've still got their hair tend to have much better protection against squamous cell carcinoma. Now the third type of skin cancer, and probably the most common skin cancer in Australia, the basal cell skin cancer, and this is the one that at least half of all Australians will get at some point in their life. The basal cell skin cancers most commonly occur on the face, particularly around the nose, the side of the nose, the eyelids, areas where you've had accumulated a lot of sun exposure over your life, and, uh, and they can also occur on the back and the trunk. 
So pretty much any part of the body can be affected, but the different types of skin cancers have their favorite spots where they like to, they like to start. The vast majority of patients I see with skin cancer have already found it themselves. So they know that there's a spot that they're a little bit worried about, that they're a bit concerned about, and it hasn't gone away. And I think intuition, when you, when you find a spot that you're worried about, that intuition is really powerful. Now, most spots on your skin that are gonna go away by themselves will have usually done so within four weeks and certainly within six weeks. So if you've still got a spot on your skin that's still worrying you after six weeks, you need to see your doctor. Don't wait, get active. So what is it that makes people find a spot that they worry about? I think the best strategy for people is to be familiar with your skin. When you come out of the shower, have a look at your skin, have a look at your back, have a look at your chest, and just be familiar with what are the normal spots that you've had that they have been there all your life that haven't changed. And so when something changes on your skin, something new appears, you pick it up when you go. So really the diagnosis of skin cancer is a partnership. It's a partnership between the patient and the doctor you look at your skin, come along to the doctor with any concerns, things that you might not, you know, might not be quite right, and then the, the doctor can very quickly usually give you a yes or no. This one is clearly okay, this one's clearly not okay, or this one, a little bit uncertain, we might need to do a test on it, do a biopsy, so that we establish the diagnosis. But know your skin, and if you've got a nagging voice at the back saying, I need to do something about this spot, go and do it. Don't, don't sit there and wait and watch it grow. So if you have a partner, get your partner to have a look at your skin. Particularly useful for examining your back, your lower legs. Um, but what you should do is have a bright light and a handheld mirror. And just be familiar with certain parts of the body that you might not look at generally. So look at your armpits, look at over your shoulder, look at your back, uh, look at your buttocks. Um, check those areas that might not be otherwise easy to see. How do I catch that melanoma early because of course the sooner you make the diagnosis, the sooner you have it excised, the longer you're gonna live. What you should be looking out for is a new mole, a pre-existing mole that's undergoing change. And that could be change in size, change in shape, change in color. It could bleed. Uh, they're generally not painful. They're often not elevated, they're often flat. So really you need to be looking at your skin and identifying change and if it's the one thing the one take home message from this, look out for any pigmented or colored spot on your skin that's changing. The best doctor for you to see is the doctor that not only knows about skin, but also knows about you. So the best place to start is with your GP, who knows your family history, who knows about your behavior in the sun, who knows about your lived experience. That's the best place to start to get your skin check. The one main treatment that's required is to excise that melanoma, completely remove it from your skin as quickly as possible. And if you have that melanoma cut out from your skin, usually requires some stitches to sew it up again, then there's a 90% chance then that will be the end of the story, that's all that you're going to need to have done. After you've had a melanoma removed, there's a, a plan of regular follow-up examinations, starting off with three monthly examinations for the first two years, then six monthly examinations for the next three years, and then lifelong annual skin checks at a minimum so that you can detect that second primary melanoma as soon as possible. If you have had a keratinocyte cancer, a BCC or an SCC, there's actually a range of different treatments that can be used based on the uh, size of the tumour and the particular body part on which it occurs. In some body parts, low-risk tumours might be able to be treated with a cream or with injections. In other parts of the body, they might be treated surgically. Uh, and there's even a range of emerging uh, treatments, including uh, chemotherapy and, of course, radiotherapy, which has been around for 50 or 60 years, can also be used to treat some of these skin cancers. If you've had a keratinocyte cancer, Again, this is often a chronic disease. The keratinocyte cancers are usually a cry for help from your skin saying, I am distressed skin, I'm starting to develop skin cancers, and if I keep going out in the sun, I'm gonna get more and more skin cancers, and even if I don't go out in the sun, I'm gonna to continue to be at risk of getting other skin cancers. And so these people also need to monitor their skin and have periodic examinations with their doctor. I think that's probably a mistake. I don't think it's as simple as just walking in, having it cut out, burnt off. 
And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that the surgery itself might be quite complicated. And if you're lucky and you've caught it early, it might be a simple scar that might be barely, barely visible. But if it's a little bit more advanced and you need a skin graft, you're gonna have a mark, a stigma on your face, a sign um, that you're gonna be looking at in the mirror every time you look in the mirror reminding you that, um, that you've had a skin cancer. And if you get one on the lip or you get one on the ear, it can really be quite disfiguring. And even the simpler surgery has risks. It involves anaesthetics, stitches, there's a risk of infection. If done well, those risks are small, but they're not zero. Modify your exposure to the thing that's causing the cancer in the first place. That's the sun, protect yourself from, from the harmful effects of sunlight. Doesn't mean you have to stay out of the sun completely, but try and minimize the harm associated with sun exposure. And then secondary prevention, which is how do you minimize risk once you've been exposed, and that's early detection, early planning. But dying from melanoma is potentially avoidable. Look at your skin and act on it. If you see a new mole or a changing mole, don't let yourself die for something that could have been prevented. From a personal note as a dermatologist who's worked in the area for 30 years, I would love to never have to have to tell a patient that they've got an incurable melanoma. I've seen children grow up without fathers or without mothers. I've seen families destroyed by deaths associated with melanoma. And if only they would have come sooner and we could have caught the melanoma at an earlier stage and treated it then, all of this could have been prevented. So with regards to the purchase of the sunscreen, you want to look for one with a high SPF or sunscreen protection factor. There are many products out there with an SPF of 50 and that will be perfect for sun protection. The next part of the equation is how do you actually get the most out of it? And so you need to choose a formulation that's compatible with your skin that you're going to use. So if you want to use it while you go jogging, then a sports sunscreen might be useful. If you're worried about the, the, the tint on your skin, then you might get a tinted sunscreen, but you need to have one that you're comfortable with and that you're going to use. The best sun protection is with clothing, with hats, with sunglasses and seeking the shade. And for those areas that you can't otherwise protect, then sunscreen becomes really important, as long as it's applied correctly. I've got an olive complexion. I tan very easily when I go out in the sun. I've played a lot of sport in my youth, played a lot of cricket. And about a year ago, I started to get a little crusty scab on the side of my nose. It didn't look like very much. Fortunately, being a dermatologist, I was able to take photographs, show it to some of my colleagues, and in the end, we decided that it probably needed a biopsy and it turned out to be a BCC. And even though it was probably no bigger than about four or five millimetres in size, I caught it very early, partly because it was right, you know, right in front of me. Every time I looked in the mirror, it was right on my nose. Um, and it was cut out by a plastic surgeon. There's a very nice, neat scar along the side of my nose and I'm very thankful to my, my surgeon for that. But it hurt, it was not pleasant. Someone who's been on the other side of the syringe and the needle for many years, I didn't realize how much it does sting. It certainly uh, brings a tear to your eye when you have the local anesthetic. Once the local's in, it didn't hurt after that. But I was very fortunate because I was probably only a couple of months away from it being too big to be sewn up as a straight line and needing a skin graft, which would have meant that uh, it would have changed my appearance forever. If you're fortunate and you act quickly, then you might end up with a scar that's barely visible like mine. But if you delay treatment, delay the diagnosis, then the consequences can be dire. And so having had a skin cancer, I know that I'm at increased risk of getting another one. And so that makes it even more important that I stay in tune with my skin. I'm familiar with what's on my skin, what's normal, what belongs and identify anything that's different, anything that's not quite right.